Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hi, Martin. Are you doing well? Martin, I'm still doing the same, more or less, as last time, yes. Okay, I hope that was well. I can't remember if it was well. Uh, so far, it's been well every time, even though it hasn't always been so well. <laughs> it's always been well. <laughs> we have to have a positive outlook. Exactly. This is the place where, no matter how bad your day is going, when I ask you how it's going, you have to say it's well. It's, it's, it's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once again we are here, we are discussing important matters, and we ask you to bless and enlighten our minds, and we thank you that we can do these. In Jesus' name, Amen. We are continuing with our story. So, uh, let's just reiterate that one cannot change one's story. Yeah. Because I have had occasions when people said I should change my testimony. It is offensive to some. But, you know, it's very hard to change your testimony because that's exactly what happened, right? Yes. Or at least how you perceive how it happened. Yeah. So, let's continue. But before we mm. go into that, we just want to have a little chat about some of the events that are happening so that we don't forget yeah. that we are running on a timetable. You know, some people are thinking, the Lord delays His coming. And after the long delay, is it still relevant that the Lord is coming, etc.? Now, personally, I don't think there's any delay. I think it's right on time. Mm -hmm. But that's my personal view, which not everybody will share. But I think that the coming of Christ is imminent. And that's why uh, we are looking at the prophetic unfoldings with great interest. Yes. Because whatever happens has to fit into the prophetic picture. Because God has never erred. If you take the book of Daniel. Yeah. And you see how those kingdoms came and how these events took place? The fault never lies with God. And He never changes. And if it lies somewhere, it lies mm. with us and with our understanding. Yes. So let's jump right into it. We are aware that COP26 is on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, ecumenism and labor unions will play a major role in the upcoming events. Mm -hmm. And we know what prophecy has to say on these issues, so let's just see whether we are still on track here. Yes, if the things that are happening in the world are falling in line with what prophecy says. Correct. Martin, I see America is always uh, <laughs> in the midst of things, right? I mean... That's the horse's mouth. That's that it. If you want to hear something, you hear it from the horse's mouth. Yes, this is the Jesuit Journal. So this is the Jesuit Review, October the 4th, 2021. Pope Francis and 40 faith leaders call for urgent action to combat climate change. Future generations will never forgive us. So the church has mm. to have a united voice on this issue, together with the state. Yep. Now, if the church and state unite on an issue and start legislating, then that's the image of the beast, right? Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Correct. In an unprecedented response to the grave threat facing all peoples worldwide from climate change, Pope Francis and some 40 faith leaders representing the world's major religions have joined in an appeal for urgent action. And the faith leaders represent an estimated 84% of the world's people that identify with the faith, and they come from the main Christian denominations, the two main branches of Islam, Sunni and Shia, Judaism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Zoroastrianism, and Jainism. Christians present at the signing in the Vatican included Pope Francis, Bartholomew I, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, Metrop 
Metropolitan Hilarion of the Russian Orthodox Church representing Patriarch Kirill and Archbishop Justin Welby of Canterbury representing the Anglican Communion. There were Muslim representatives that included Grand Imam of Alzar, Ahmad Mohammed al Tayeb from Egypt, and Ayatollah Sayed Mustafa Moagek Damat from the Academy of Sciences in Tehran, while the worldwide Jewish community was represented by Rabbi Noam Marans of the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations and Rabbi Daniel Swartz of the Coalition on the Environment and Jewish Life. So many of the churches seem to have shifted their evangelical zeal mm. towards climate agendas. This is a, 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 a glue for ecumenism at, at this stage. It has nothing to do with the everlasting gospel, but it is a sideshow that has been introduced. Now I find it interesting, Martin, that there is such thorough preparation. So the first thing was to get all the faith leaders on board. Then they had a ceremony at the Vatican where they jointly signed a document with their intent to present to the COP26 mm. forum. Joe Biden will be visiting the Pope, as we will see, on the 29th of October, just before the opening of the great event in Glasgow. Then on the 31st, which is of course uh, Reformation Day, mm. but it's also Halloween Day, where the communication between the other world and this world was opened up and the, the dead uh, divide will be removed. Mm. That is what Halloween is all about. They will be meeting on that day, and then the next day, uh, the great COP26 will commence. So let's just listen to this news broadcast on what happened at the Vatican with the faith leaders. Now, religious leaders from around the world have issued a joint appeal for international politicians to agree to a new global deal to combat climate change. Christian, Buddhist, Muslim and Jewish leaders were among those attending the gathering at the Vatican hosted by the Pope. For their part, the faith leaders made a commitment to educating and influencing their followers about climate change. The BBC's Mark Lowen is in Rome. They came from across the planet faith leaders urging politicians to save it. Christian and Jewish, Buddhist and Muslim, Taoist and Confucian, signing a joint appeal to world leaders who will meet at the COP26 in Glasgow to commit to net zero emissions, to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, to support poorer countries. A Pope who has focused on environmental concern and an Archbishop with this warning. Our abuse, our war against the climate, affects the poorest among us. Reconciliation with creation, in obedience to our Creator, proclaims the love of God. The world has just enough time to get this right. In return, the signatories say they'll educate their faithful, spreading the message of climate awareness. The document was handed to Alok Sharma, the COP president, to take to next month's summit, telling us the faith leaders are an essential resource. The message from them has been very clear. This is a critical moment for the world, and the message was one of the head and the heart. The scientists telling us the message from the head is very clear, is that it is humanity that is creating climate change, and we need to act now. And the message of the heart is about morality. The call is urgent. Man-made climate change and fossil fuels have prompted the warmest decade on record with floods, fires and heat waves. This may be the last chance to halt the damage. Religion and science don't always go hand in hand. Climate change deniers are sometimes fueled by religious conservatives. But with research finding 84% of people around the globe identify with a faith, world leaders know that those meeting here today have a chance of getting their followers to change their behavior.
Mark Lowen, BBC News at the Vatican. Well, Martin, that is very interesting. So we have to follow the head, which is reason, according to them. And uh, that's what the scientific world had to say. Now, what about all the great disasters of the past? Mm. They weren't climate change, correct? <laughs> Especially those that took place before the Industrial Revolution. Because mm. I hear Greta Thunberg has taken the British Empire to task for the Industrial Revolution. Yes. Uh, while she was partying away, <laughs> using the benefits of the Industrial Revolution. Yes, it's all very interesting. And of course, what brand of science are you following? Popular mm -hmm. brand or another brand? So this is all very interesting. Do these people that have come together there representing 84% of the world's mm -hmm. population? Uh, the question is, are they really representing the truth? Or are they representing what is conveniently perceived as truth yes. at the present time. That, that has been put into the media the whole time and eventually you have no other choice to be, but to believe it. Correct. So if you repeat something over and over mm. and over again, eventually people might just believe it, right? And that's the way it is. The Bible tells us that when they all come together, mm and they all are of one accord and shout peace and safety, that's when sudden destruction comes. So this is a very uh, prophetic picture yeah. that we are watching here at the moment. Now, somehow I have the feeling that many of the decisions that will be made at COP26 have had some preparation, of course. He definitely. And I'm wondering if many of those decisions haven't already been made and will just be basically rubber stamped mm -hmm. at that particular uh, venue. So here's an article from Reuters, October 14. Biden to meet with Pope, push for global minimum tax at G20 in Rome. So he will meet with Pope Francis on October the 29th before attending a two-day summit of G20 leaders in Rome where he hopes to reach agreement on a global minimum tax of 15%, White House officials said on Thursday. At the Group of 20 meeting of the world's major economies, Biden will focus on reaching a deal on a global minimum tax as well as fighting the COVID-19 pandemic and boosting the global economic recovery. It's interesting that this global tax climate change is still linked to the pandemic. Yes. Right? They're, they joined it, the umbilical cord. It's actually interesting that the whole COVID issue gave this whole climate agenda a push. Correct. So they used the one to further the other. And I read an article the other day that the pandemics are actually on the increase because of the climate change. So no matter which way you look at it, <laughs> whether cause or effect, they're playing both sides of the field. That's it. If you remember, there was that article that said the earth is uh, mad. It's like a punishment. Punishment, yes. Yes, okay. At the Glasgow Climate Summit, Biden's announcements about U.S. commitments of cash and action to fight global warming will be closely watched by other countries and advocacy groups who are wary of the U.S. record on climate change after Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord. You know what's also interesting? Hmm. I watched a video the other day from the auto manufacturers which shows that uh, the electric vehicles that they are producing at the moment really don't contribute to, cli to the climate change agenda at all. Mm. Because even one of the very smallest vehicles, you'll have to drive almost 100,000 kilometers before there's any gain in yeah. terms of CO2 emission. Because the production of the batteries mm -hmm. and everything that is involved and, the, and also the use of the batteries contributes also to the CO2 emission. 
And if you have a larger vehicle, like a, a diesel car or something, you would have to drive well over 150,000 kilometers before it will make any difference whatsoever. Yeah. So in the final analysis, if the vehicles had stayed exactly as they were, uh, the equation would have remained exactly the same. A lot of it is purely hype to achieve a agenda. And we have to see Ex what is the agenda behind the agenda. Exactly, because the logic, if you really start laying out logic in some of these areas, yes. I mean, take Africa, for instance, how are you going to get that electrified vehicles in there? Exactly. There's a lot of logic that's missing. So that's why you have to realize there's an agenda Correct. that they're pushing. Now, the agenda obviously is world unification. Mm. That's point number one. Uh, they want to have not only the political leaders, but also the industrial leaders, as well as the religious leaders on the same page. Now, who separated the nations, Martin? God did. God separated mm -hmm. them, right? And the reason for that is so that we would remain dependent upon him. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's interesting to me that the Pope has already said, or that they have opined, that we cannot look up for help in this crisis. We have to do this ourselves. Yeah. Now, that in itself is a departure from faith. I think Nimrod had the same sentiment. I think it is the, the sentiment of Nimrod, exactly. Another very interesting feature about all of this is the role of the trade unions. Now, we have statements in the spirit of prophecy that tell us exactly what we can expect from the trade unions. But of course, if they're going to play a prominent role, then they must be portrayed as the heroes and not the villains in all of this, right? Mm -hmm. So here was an interesting uh, meeting that Joe Biden had with some of the leaders of these unions. Let's have a look at that. We were just uh, back in, in the green room and the president was talking to President Schuler and Jocelyn and he said, this is labor's house. Uh, and how often do you hear that? I want to welcome everyone to the White House. And I really mean that. This is your house. It's not hyperbole. It's a fact. This is your house. I wouldn't be here without you. That's, again, not hyperbole. In my White House, you'll always be welcome. You'll always be welcome. Labor will always be welcome. You know, you've heard me uh, say many times, I intend to be the most pro-union president, leading the most pro-union administration in American history. But I think one of the reasons I'm able to do that is the public is changing, too. You've changed the public. You've educated them a lot. And every day we remember that America wasn't built by Wall Street. They're not all bad folks on Wall Street. I'm not suggesting that. But they didn't build America. It was built by the middle class. And unions built the middle class. Now, Martin, that's a very interesting statement. The most pro-union president in the history of the United States, mm -hmm. right? Let's read a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. Labor unions are a source of trouble for Adventists. The trade unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as not been since the world began. A few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in certain lines of business. Trade unions will be formed and those who refuse to join these unions will be marked men. These are very interesting statements. Mm. Because of these unions and confederacies, it will soon be very difficult for our institutions to carry on their work in the cities. My warning is keep out of the cities, build no sanitariums in the cities. The time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. Uh, I find it fascinating that there is legislation that those who do not conform with current government decrees mm. will not be able to work, yes. buy or sell. Mm. And the labor unions will play a major role in that. So that is a very oppressive agenda, right? Yeah. It's interesting that she says 
that uh, if you refuse to join these unions, you will be marked men. Mm. Now, when I was still with the university, uh, I was the head of our department that I was in, and as such, I was required to join the labor union. And that was a very interesting event that happened. And uh, I was called in to the powers that be and told that uh, you know, I have to set a good example <laughs> and be part of the labor union. And I said, I'm terribly sorry, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I won't join the labor union. So they said to me, I have no choice. I have to join the labor union. I said, no, I won't. <laughs> I won't join the labor union. And they were, they were very upset with me. And basically, it came to the point where I said, if you force me, then I will resign. Mm. And uh, that, that created quite a consternation. And they asked me what my problem was. I said, it's against my religious conviction. So they said, they don't understand because there are others who are of the same denomination that I belong to and they're part of the trade union. Mm. So what's my problem? The world doesn't understand this kind of thinking, right? Yeah. So I said to them, you know, if there are others, then that's their decision. But as for me, my answer is no. And so they, they wanted to know why. So I went to, there was a blackboard in the room that we were talking. So I went to the blackboard and I drew a circle representing a cake. And then I divided the cake into slices. And uh, said, well, this is this industry, this is that industry, this is the metal industry, this is the teacher's industry, etc., etc., and each one of them represented by a trade union. And the more powerful the trade union, the more clout they have. So on an annual basis, there would be negotiations with the trade union and with the, the powers that be on, let's say, wage negotiations. And if you have a powerful trade union, then you can call powerful strikes and you can basically paralyze a country or paralyze the education system or paralyze whatever you want to paralyze. Yeah. And the more powerful your trade union, the more powerful your voice. So if the cake has a certain size, and your trade union is so powerful that it can increase your slice, then what must that do to the other slices? Decrease it. It must decrease mm. the other slices. That's one aspect. So your voice is able to bring about a demise of the other party yeah. that doesn't have such a powerful voice. And then if you lay a country lame, that only affects you or does it affect everyone? Everyone. And then I said, uh, those basic principles then, do they reflect love your neighbor? No. And if they don't reflect love your neighbor, if they reflect love yourself more than your neighbor, then uh, it is not a principle that I would like to go along with. So I refuse to be part of the trade union. And I told the story last time that when I was in Germany, some of the leaders within our denomination came to me and said I wasn't allowed to say anything negative about trade unions. Mm. And I, s I said, why? And remember they went and s stood in a huddle and came back and said, when I asked them, okay, if I don't say anything, will you accept the blood be on your head? Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and they agreed that it should be on their head. I mean, it's amazing. This is a, this is a, a war that stretches across the entire terrain. And as Biden said, he's the most pro-trade union president. Therefore, I can assume that he also is not in harmony with what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy teaches on love your neighbor. 
No, and then also he might be part of fulfillment of prophecy when reading these quotes. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, the, just for interest's sake, I didn't put it in, but there is the whole striketober movement going on in America where they've got all these strikes going on and there are also some unions that are calling for rest. Now, many of these, these trade unions have signed uh, Sunday legislation that's papers in Europe. So that's one of the means to bring about the time of trouble because if the world is coerced into that direction, mm. it means that probation will close and the plagues will fall. Yeah. So they will be one of the means to bring about a time of trouble such as never was. And one of the means that they're bringing this in is they're complaining that they're working too much hours. So they want reduced hours. And therefore they'll also be calling for a day of rest. And they're already doing it. Correct. And uh, as they did in, in Greece, for example, they were forced, in order to get the bailout funds a few years ago, mm -hmm. they were forced to change to a six-day work week with fewer working hours. Mm. And you could not uh, work more hours in order to make up for any other lost time. And therefore, Sunday was theoretically the only day yeah. that was available to be a rest day. Mm. We read in Christ Objects Lessons, it is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were aroused from their slumber. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares. But one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation. So now, a sudden and unlocked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. So there is a big surprise coming, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and the big surprise will uh, be a calamity, and it can bring you face to face with death. Well, didn't COVID already start this ball rolling? It started the ball, ball rolling, and if you can't buy and sell because of associated legislation, then you could face starvation, right, and, and hardship. And we've had numerous of these leaders tell us that they will be the next calamities. Correct. And they're already talking about Marburg and its effects and uh, all of the issues that the disease will be similar to Ebola, etc., cetera, mm. etc. Cetera. They're, they're marvelously predictive, aren't they? Yeah. Well, it's interesting if we take this part that says it will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God when these things start happening. Correct. And uh, we get, we're receiving so many letters of people that are so distraught, mm. right? But uh, we now have to have faith in the promises of God. And she's quite right. Faith is something that needs to be exercised. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't had an opportunity to exercise our faith thus far, then how will we learn it at the 11th hour? Like it says there, it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. So many will then go along with the stream, but fall into a greater calamity. Yeah. I saw our people in great distress, weeping and praying, pleading the sure promises of God. While the wicked were all around us, mocking us, threatening to destroy us, they ridiculed our feebleness, they mocked at the smallness of our numbers, taunted us with words calculated to cut deep. They charged us with taking an independent position from all the rest of the world. They had cut off our resources so that we could not buy or sell and referred to our abject poverty and stricken condition. 
They could not see how we could live without the world. We were dependent upon the world and we must concede to the customs, practices and laws of the world or go out of it. If we were the only people in the world whom the Lord favored, the appearances were awfully against us. Do you have a gut feeling that this is closer than we think? Definitely. And as as I look out, we want to capitulate it brings warning signs if we want to capitulate to to the world mm. and uh, say this is not the final event then we could very easily fall into a trap yeah but looking at it prophetically looking at the churches coming together signing a climate mm. accord representing 84 percent of humanity so they claim handing that over to the governments of the world, mm. deciding on a tax, a universal tax, and they will be deciding on measures on how to control it. And it will be the world all together now, one, two, three, here we go, yeah. in one accord. Yeah. right. And then a small group says, sorry, mm. we will not run in the stream. You will be ridiculed. Definitely. There will be additional penalties that will be brought in. You will probably lose your job mm -hmm. and you will be cut off from all human aid. And then they will start mocking. Yeah. Has it already begun? Yes. Yes, it has already begun. Yes. And thousands upon thousands are in the same situation and many institutions have already created the legislation that you will no longer be able to work in this institution. Mm -hmm. And that cuts across the board. Do we want to be part of that? No, we have to get out of there. That is the point. We cannot be part of that. You see, the other thing is, where did all these faith leaders go to sign? They went to the Vatican. And Pope Francis has an encyclical directed towards climate change, and Correct. the Sunday legislation are enshrined in there. So you have to put the puzzle together. You have to put it together, and if it fits, then uh, you should beware, and you should take note. No, we need watchmen on the walls of Zion. Mm. Now, I was uh, telling my story, yeah. and uh, some of the things that happened to me, and Let's be honest, some of the things that are happening even within our church are disconcerting to mm. many people, including myself. Mm. And as we repeatedly said, just because some people do this, that or the other, doesn't make this church Babylon. Yeah. Because this church has a bottom-up structure yeah. by its very nature. We are all brethren. And any major decision that would change a doctrinal position has to be taken at a world gathering of the entire church called a general conference in session. Isn't it the same as the Jerusalem Council and all of that that happened in Paul's time? Exactly. No wonder that the new translations want to <laughs> change the wording so that it looks like a top-down structure. Mm. But it's not a top-down structure. Correct. It's the, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren to the brethren, and not the apostles and elders, comma, mm. to the brethren. That is a distortion of the text, and uh, many would love that distortion of the text. So the beauty of the Advent movement mm. is even if there are people in leadership that cut across that directive doesn't make this church Babylon. No. Whereas if you have a system like the papacy, mm. where you have ultramontanism, one man makes the decision for all, yeah. well, if he makes a decision and that is the decision of the faith, then you're trapped in that, in that system, right? And unfortunately, all the other denominations work like that. They have a synod, right? Yes, synod. So they make a decision and it affects everyone. Mm. No, here, the elders, 
and the brethren have to come together to make a decision and it must be representative of the entire mm -hmm. world church. Yes. It's a unique situation. So Martin, when I was banned in Germany mm -hmm. because of what happened at uh, one of our colleges there in that little town with that little group of Bible and testimony believing people had invited me, that ban was eventually lifted, right? But later on, that ban was reimposed. Now, there's quite a history to that because uh, there was a lot of consternation when I was banned the first time. And many of the brethren who then went and studied this issue, including many of the leaders, came to the conclusion that maybe I shouldn't have been banned in that, in that mm -hmm. country. And so they unbanned me. But many were not happy with the fact that I had been unbanned. They would prefer to have that voice silenced entirely. But uh, it's interesting that some of the leaders there had actually entered into an ecumenical relationship. Uh, first as guests, mm. guest members, and later as full members of the councils. And of course, this creates consternation. And some of the leading brethren signed a document called the Charta Ecumenica. Mm. Now, if you study that document through, then you, between the lines, will find that you are actually supporting papal supremacy. Now, anybody in his right mind can sign something like that is beyond comprehension. But some of the leaders actually went into a formal uh, membership of bodies that are affiliated with the ecumenical council. Very often, they don't join the ecumenical council direct, but they join bodies that are directly affiliated. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same thing. And the question is, how can you be a member of a body that has the purpose to bring all the churches back to a unified voice? And particularly also, of course, a acceptance of the papal position. Yeah. So some of the letters that went between the leadership in those countries and that ecumenical representation are very eye-opening. For example, there were uh, ex letters exchanged between some of our leaders and Dr. Heinz Helt, who was the bishop in charge of that ecumenical body within Europe. Yeah. And the question was then raised, how can you be a member if you call the Pope Antichrist? Yeah. Now it's interesting that some of our leaders then would write and say, uh, that is a 19th century ideology, a leftover from the Reformation. Mm. And some of our other leaders would write articles and state that we cannot be bound to a 19th century ideology. Rome certainly has changed, mm. whereas the spirit of prophecy tells us that Rome has not changed. Yes. And we did a series on the doctrine of the serpent, right? Mm -hmm. In the What's Up Prof That's series. It. And we had a number of them to show that there is absolutely no change in Rome. So the only change that we have is in appearance. That's it. Chameleon. It's a chameleon. Yeah. She hides her doctrines under this acceptable ac exterior. Mm. And, uh, but beneath that acceptable exterior is the doctrine of the serpent. And that's it. So it is amazing that these, some of these leaders would then try to suggest that they represent the church. They don't represent mm. the church, they represent themselves. Mm. And uh, they are doing it with the full knowledge of even higher leadership. Many of them are on that page, but many of them are not. So again, let's make it quite clear. 
that at every single level you will find people that are faithfully adhering to the biblical and testimony admonitions. And then you have those that find it more comfortable to walk the road of popular acceptance. Yeah. Now, once you have said that uh, the church, according to them, does no longer adhere to the idea that the papacy represents the Antichrist, then the next step is, well, if you want to be a member of this organization, mm -hmm. you better keep your subjects in check. So someone like myself, Mm -hmm. who will say that uh, the beast of Revelation chapter 13 is the papacy, is obviously not very welcome, and mm -hmm. therefore any precedent that can be found to silence the voice will be jumped upon. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Because that little thorn has to be taken care of. Uh, that thorn in the flesh has to be removed. Mm -hmm. Now, just because some in leadership feel that way doesn't mean that everybody in leadership feels that way, right? So I actually gave a lecture in Germany, and one of the issues that came up was what is the role of literal Israel? Now, why that is important mm. is because there are so many dispensationalists in the world that believe that literal Israel has a prominent role to play. Yes. But the Bible is very clear that those that are in Christ are the Israel of God. And so I gave a lecture where I showed biblically that the true Israel of God is not the literal Israel that exists today, mm. but the spiritual Israel, which consists of all peoples, every nation, tribe, and people, even from within the Jewish ranks, right? Yeah. Then I also mentioned that the present-day Jews that are living in the Jewish state at the moment are not all literal descendants of Judah. So if you want to literalize it, and you want to say that they are the literal descendants of Abraham, then in many a case this is not so because many of the, the Jews had been converted from other nations mm. and become Jews. So they weren't the literal descendants, so dispensationalism doesn't even count. And I mentioned, for example, the Khazars. And then a huge cry went up, and they said that that was anti-Semitic. Yeah. It's interesting that 10 days later, Der Spiegel, which is like Time magazine in, in Germany, produced an article saying exactly the same thing. But someone found it necessary to accuse me to the state for anti-Semitism. Now, uh, that was a, a major thing. And then there were a couple of, of little things, like some faux pas. I just want to ask, it's a very serious accusation in Germany. Well, if, if you are accused of anti-Semitism in Germany, then the state is obligated mm. by law to investigate the issue. So to make such a claim is a very serious accusation. Mm. And uh, there's another thing that happened. I was speaking about the time of the fascist regime mm. in Europe and how the Jews were obligated to wear a yellow band. Now, I come from South Africa. You are Afrikaans speaking, right, Martin? Yes. And you know that in Afrikaans, uh, the diminutive is often used. Everything is key, mm -hmm. which means small, small. right? And yeah. then you even have double diminutives. Yeah, yeah. Key, key, my key, key. Yeah. Or a little basket, a little, little basket. Yeah. So uh, it's a, I found that a very cute uh, aspect of this language that you use the diminutive. Mm. So if something is small, then it is always key. Mm. Now, in Germany, it, this can create some confusion. <laughs> and there was a language barrier. And, uh, you know, a lot of my German is uh, from my childhood. 
And later in my life, I learned Afrikaans and I taught at an Afrikaans university. So my Afrikaans became almost like a first language together with English. And your wife is Afrikaans. And then my wife was Afrikaans. Mm. So then I started speaking Afrikaans at home. So this became the language that mm. I was acquainted with. And there are a lot of similarities mm. between uh, the Germanic languages like Dutch and Afrikaans and German. And so, for example, if you use a diminutive in Afrikaans, then it is endearing. Yeah. Right? It is, it's cute. Mm. And often if you use the diminutive in German, then it's derogatory. Ah. So I, I had uh, this nuance problem. And I called it a tiny band, ein Tüchlein, which is a small band. Mm. And they found this terribly offensive and thought I was being specifically derogatory. I had another occasion in Germany when that happened to me, because in Afrikaans, if somebody is exceedingly sensitive mm. and uh, kind-hearted and sensitive, then you say she has a small heart. Yeah. Yes. A klein harki. Yes. Right? It's you sweet. understand that? S somebody that's sweet. That's sweet. It means they're lovely. easily affectionate. Yes. And, and also easily slighted. Yes. Uh, they, you have to be careful with them. You have mm. to, you know, they're sweet and lovely and beautiful and and say the klein harki. That's yeah. someone you want to go and give a big hug, right? That's it, yeah. Now, if you say in German someone has a small heart, it means they're stingy. Oh. <laughs> and so I said she had a small heart, meaning she was cute and affectionate and lovely. Uh. And they took it. Uh, she was mean and stingy and bitter, and they were highly offended. So sometimes you have these language barriers. And this also contributed to the issue. And so they used this as a precedent and they accused me. I explained myself in a letter. And the interesting thing is, you know, people won't believe you. They think you're lying. Mm. But you're my witness. You live in this country, right? Mm. <laughs> Same one as I do. I, I got back from Germany and, they, and uh, some had uh, accused me of this to the state. And there was a huge furor and they tried to get hold of me by telephone and they couldn't. Mm. But it sounded like the phone was ringing, so obviously I was ignoring them, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, yes. Now, what had happened was <laughs> I lived on a farm and uh, that time when I arrived there in one night, they stole. Mm -hmm. 10 kilometers of telephone wires. Now, not even the government with its entire team can achieve that in a week. No. But a thief can achieve that in one night. So there was no communication. And this was, of course, also taken amiss. But in any case, I was accused of anti-Semitism and immediately banned again from Germany. Now, the state had to investigate this issue. And uh, the police came and they confiscated my DVDs from the venue where I had given these lectures. Mm. And they were live streamed, these lectures. So the state confiscated them and they said, you know, you need a lawyer because this is serious. You can, you can be put away in jail. And uh, I was wondering, you know, who, who would do something like that? Who would go and accuse someone on the basis of a biblical mm. uh, lecture? Who would do something like that? Who would be of that frame of mind? And the government investigated this for an entire year. Yeah. So they studied the issue and they also approached the representatives of the Jewish community, the leaders in the, in the whole of Germany and gave them the DVDs to watch. So as I said, you can do nothing against the truth. Mm. You can only do something for the truth. Mm. So the 
the government officials investigating the issue, they had to watch all those DVDs. Yeah. And then the Jewish representatives, they had to watch all those DVDs. Mm. And uh, this sword was hanging over my head, you know. <laughs> Will I be called to go <laughs> to jail for anti-Semitism? Uh, and then finally, uh, the government, after a year, issued a statement saying, there was no anti-Semitism. Mm. And even the Jewish representatives said there was zero anti-Semitism. And we managed to legally obtain the charge sheet. And we know who the individual is that uh, laid the charge. Mm. And it's interesting that this individual is associated with uh, some of the, or was associated at that time, with uh, some of the press organizations within the church. And that his own Facebook page reflects that he attends Jesuit retreats. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting, Martin? Very interesting. So the government totally exonerated me on that issue. But uh, do you think they unbanned me? The church? Yes. No. No. Do you think they apologized to me? No. No. They put me through one year of turmoil with no apology. Now it's interesting, again, is it the whole of the leadership that has this mindset? No. no. Because when they banned me, many realized that this was a trumped up charge. Mm. In fact, it was a blatant lie. Yeah. Because uh, when it comes to anti-Semitism or racism, I am of the opinion, and I've been on record on many occasions, mm. and my whole life, by the way, yeah. testifies to mm. that issue, that uh, any one of those isms are abhorrent to me. And I believe that God created all men in the image of God, and that doesn't mean that we are all of the same ideology. Mm. But if someone embraces the truth, that makes me happy and I don't discriminate what tribe or race or people comes from. They are brothers and sisters in Christ when they accept Christ. And before that, they can be friends and they can be mission objects. That's it, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So in any case, some of the countries, when I was banned, said that this was, this was unfair mm. and therefore they did not ban me. So I was banned in Germany, but I wasn't banned in the neighboring German-speaking countries. Yeah. So I could still speak <laughs> in German. And there are open borders today, so yeah. it really didn't help them at all. Mm. In fact, it furthered the debate. That's it. Again, God l allowed this? Correct. To get it out into a debate. Correct. So you can do nothing against the truth. Mm. And instead of helping their cause, it was actually detrimental to their cause. And I've had so many occasions like that where things happened that seemed, you know, horrendous. Was there a time when I was uh, upset about this and about their action and about their accusations? And Martin, to this day, there are some of our writers that take up this mantra and will blatantly state that I'm an anti-Semite, mm. which is, of course, a blatant lie. Now, what do I do about it? Well, I just ignore it. Is it? Uh, so I have never said anything publicly um, until this moment about how I felt. But there were times when I was very bitter mm. towards the, the German leadership. And I was called in to the division in Europe. And the presidency had changed. The president was no longer the one that I had confronted earlier, who was uh, the one who brought in so many of the, or permitted so many of the liberal uh, movements to enter the church. But the second one, he was, he was incredibly rude to me and accused me of evangelizing for money. He was the one. 
And so I had many of these discussions and I explained my situation, but uh, did it change their stance? No. Yeah. It's interesting, in that same building, where you walk through the building, the staff, they embrace you like brothers and sisters, but some of these leaders are just unbelievable. And they are of the exact opposite mindset that I am of, for example. So obviously, we don't sit around the same table. Mm -hmm. But many of the other leaders are of the same mindset as I am, for example. Yeah. So within that high echelon of leadership, you have all the groups represented. Mm -hmm. And we're not all going to be on the same page when this thing finally comes to fruition. Some of them wouldn't even talk within that building because they didn't even trust their own building or whether it was wired or not. Uh -huh. And would only talk to me outside the building. So it's very strange how some of these things happen. So again, I want to ask the question, do I leave the church because some of these people sit in those ecumenical councils? Did you stay bitter or did you go with the other B eventually? Well... I was a little bit, uh, no, let me not lie. <laughs> I was uh, quite upset mm. with what they had done and people had phoned me and, and there were lawyers that were offering their services for free to help me and I said, no, I don't need a lawyer. I have an advocate. Mm. I have the best advocate in the universe because I know what I said and I know that it's been misrepresented and I know that it is being distorted by people that have an agenda. Mm. And therefore, I left it to God. And after one year, I was totally exonerated, mm. right? And then you became better. And No, long before that. Okay. Long before that year was over. In fact, I was uh, sitting in my room one day and I was mulling over these things and mm. all these events and all the the distortions and the blatant lies that were told. And I thought to myself, how do you feel about these people? And I realized that my feelings weren't very kind. Mm. <laughs> As and I'm sure a lot of people feel. Well, I will admit, my feelings weren't very kind towards them. And, uh, and I thought to myself, you know what, are you going to walk around the rest of your life with this animosity in your in your heart and so I took a, a, a walk in the mountain all by myself and I went and sat on a rock on the mountain and I I spoke to God for a long long time and I said to him you know I don't really want these feelings can you do something about them please can you please take them away so I prayed and I asked the Lord to take away these feelings and uh, I felt better and I went home and something very strange happened. This feeling of animosity changed mm. to a feeling of pity. pity. And then I could handle it. Yeah. I actually pitied them. I felt sorry for them because what road were they on? Mm. They were acting contrary to the spirit of, of the Bible. They were acting contrary to the spirit of prophecy. And they had entrapped themselves in systems that would not allow them to live the truth as we have received it as a denomination. Let me just give you one example, Martin. Here's an article. It's from 2009 already. It's in German. And you can see it has the sign over here of the Arce car, and it clearly says the Ecumene, mm. which means the Ecumenical Council, of which many of the leaders mm -hmm. in Europe are a member in Germany. Now, it says here that the chairman of this committee warns against fundamentalism. And he says, fundamentalism, this is now in German, and creationism, and then the, the redaction adds here, uh, this is the teaching that God created 
the world in six days. Mm -hmm. That this teaching has no place in the ecumenical council. This is the opinion of the one leading out. So I want to ask you, Martin, Mm. can two walk together lest they agree? Not at all, no. So what are they doing in that council, right? Something had to give if you go Correct. to that council. So as long as they sit in that council, mm-hmm. they will not unban me. No. Now, do you think that the general person that is a member of this church and they see this hypocrisy, mm. do you think that they will not come to a point of having to make a decision? Yeah. That's why God brought it to the fore. Exactly. You can do nothing against the truth, only for the truth. Mm. Now, as I already stated, if I'm banned in one country, the, the other country, which also has echelons of leadership mm. in the church, they don't ban me. In fact, they invite me. Yeah. Uh, does that create tension between the two groups? Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. I was in, in one country, and they told me about the pressure that is mm. brought to bear. Mm upon them to conform to a liberal agenda. For example, they have youth festivals Mm. where they have music festivals which are more fit for a rock stage than for a church that represents the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. In fact, in one of those uh, concerts organized by the highest echelon of leadership, Uh, they were doing Michael Jackson representations, Mm. complete with all the gyrations that go along with that. Mm. And one of the presidents of the other country, a leader, had a long conversation with me and said he's under pressure to comply and to send the youth there. But he refused. Mm. He said, I cannot subject my the youth of our church to this kind of atmosphere to which then often threats will come of a financial nature. Mm. But you know, Martin, if we stand for truth, God will honor that decision and the the gates of heaven will be open wide and the windows in in heaven and he will pour out a blessing. If you stand for truth, Mm. truth is made prominent. Amen. It's not only that youth gatherings are organized where questionable things take place, but even in the other echelons, some of the things are absolutely amazing and you would think that you are part of the world rather than part of the ministry of Mm -hmm. Christ. So if we can just read two statements here. This comes from Christian Education. There's a great need of elevating the standard of righteousness in our schools to give instructions after God's order. Should Christ enter our institutions for the education of the youth, he would cleanse them as he cleansed the temple, banishing many things that have a defiling influence. Many of the books which the youth study would be expelled and their places would be filled with others that would inculcate substantial knowledge and abound in sentiments which might be treasured in the heart, in precepts that might govern the conduct. Shall the sentiments of unbelievers, the expressions of dissolute men, be advocated as worthy of the student's attention because they are the productions of men whom the world admires as great thinkers? Shall a Michael Jackson concert Mm. be held within the ranks of God's people? Shall men professing to believe in God gather from these unsanctified authors their expressions and sentiments and treasure them up as precious jewels to be stored away amongst the riches of the mind? God forbid! Here's one from Councils to Parents and Teachers. But there has been a class of social gatherings in so-and-so of an entirely different character, parties of pleasure, that have been a disgrace to our institutions and to the church. They encourage pride of dress, pride of appearance, self-gratification, hilarity and trifling. 
Satan is entertained as an honored guest and takes possession of those who patronize these gatherings. A view of one such company was presented to me where were assembled those who professed to believe the truth. One was seated at the instrument of music and such songs were poured forth as made the watching angels weep. There was mirth, there was coarse laughter, there was abundance of enthusiasm and a kind of inspiration. But the joy was such as Satan only is able to create. This is an enthusiasm and infatuation of which all who love God will be ashamed. Now, Martin, if you stand for this sentiment, then you will come into serious conflict with many within the church. Yes. Do I leave the church because there is conflict on this issue? No. And the thing that has to uplift you is this, this has happened 470 years already. Correct. So there are many, many things which can be twisted. Why are these people so concerned about ecumenical relationships? Because they want to seem to be part of whatever is happening in those uh, echelons, right? Yeah. And so many of the doctrines too will be manipulated. The Antichrist will no longer be who he was. Mm -hmm. We have to put that into a, a bottle called 19th century thinking. We're in a, a new mode at the moment. Uh, the relationship with other churches. You know, Martin, it's very difficult to change an entire church to accept something new. Mm. So it's better rather to make a compromise and say that we are a mosaic of truth. So all of these streams of thinking run within the church, but they are not the official teaching of the church. No. The Bible and the testimony that is the official teaching. Now it's always interesting to me that there where power is yielded, very often that is the target where the enemy will introduce those very things. Right? That's it. You were mentioning earlier about we shouldn't be scared to be cut off from maybe financial means or anything because we can, God will always provide a way. Again, let's use the title. You can do nothing against the yeah. truth, but for the truth. Yeah. If God wants to make a truth prominent, he will open the doors. Mm -hmm. He will make a way. You might be banned in one place, but the next place will un not ban you. Mm. You might be uninvited at one place and be invited right next door. And this creates much consternation. <laughs> but if God opens a door, mm. then you must walk through it. Because sometimes, like you mentioned before, you get threats yes. that you will be also even financially cut off Correct. if you don't adhere. Correct. But if you stand for principle, mm. God opens a way. Now, I've had so many occasions where this has happened. I've been invited many, many times, and then the invitation has been withdrawn. Often because some leaders will interfere. Mm. Strange enough, if you have been uninvited, then other leaders might come up for you, and you have to be re-invited in another form. Creates much consternation. And in many of my lectures, or in many of my series, I've been officially invited. Uh, that one president accused me of inviting myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I made him understand in no uncertain terms that I've never ever in my entire life invited myself. In fact, I have a problem deciding yeah. where to say no yes. and where to say yes. And it often takes a lot of prayer. And some of them, they will, as I said before, warn against attending my meetings. In one of my Australian meetings, one of the presidents said that anybody who attends my meetings will be disfellowshipped. 
in the first place, what gives anyone the right to make a statement like that? Mm. No, it might not have been in official capacity, but in a, in a fit of anger. Mm. But uh, this is in any case what the members told me. And uh, as a consequence, a few thousand people turned up to my lectures. You can do nothing against it. You could only do something for it. The best advertisement that you can have is when this happens. So I was invited to speak in a North American camp meeting. And there's always a discussion. Let's get that speaker. And then there will be those that object to that speaker. And eventually the majority won the day and I was invited. Then higher echelons get involved and say, no, you will uninvite him. Uh, because he said this, that, that, and the other, mm. right? And it's always the same issues. <laughs> but uh, this is what happens to me all the time, or happened to me when we could still travel. Just one interesting story, how, how God works. So I was invited to a very large conference in the North American continent to come and be camp meeting speaker. And then, almost at the last moment, uh, they had this pressure from above, and they phoned me and said, you at one stage said this, that, and the other. And I said, yes, I did report that, because that's what the news said. I reported what the news said. And they said, well, uh, it would be better if I didn't come. <laughs> And then another conference within the same area invited me. And so there were two. And so they were both the leadership positions, but I was the speaker in the one and not in the other. And the interesting thing is many from the other one also came to this one, so it didn't, it didn't affect anything. It still went ahead. Mm. Although the ones that had invited me said no, but others took their place. On another occasion, and I, I always find these things, I leave it totally to God. Yeah. I will not force my way into anything. But I was invited by certain people in a very important section of the North American continent. And uh, pressure was brought to bear to cancel. But some felt, no, this pressure is not warranted and we will continue, so we will arrange our own. They had some support, but many in the leadership said, no, we will not assist you in any way if you go ahead with this thing. And some of these people, you know, they didn't have great resources. How are they going to arrange a, a camp meeting with hundreds of people attending? You know, that's, a, that's quite a procedure. Yeah. How are you going to do this? And they didn't have many resources. And so they didn't have a place because they were prohibited from using any of the venues. And so there was a lot of pressure on them. And so they came together as a group and they prayed and said, Lord, how are we going to do this? And then someone said, you know, I have a tent. Now when we speak about a tent, mm -hmm. we're speaking about a huge tent. Uh, I could make that available to you guys for free. Here yeah. it is. But it had no poles or anything to, to put it up. And where are you going to hold this venue? So somebody else suggested something else and they found a, another denomination's camping ground, but it didn't have any lecturing facilities. It was just a camping ground with, you know, uh, washroom facilities, but nothing else. And so they procured that. But now they had this huge tent and they had no poles. And then another brother said, you know what, I have a piece of land that has a lot of trees on it that have to be thinned out anyway. Let's go and have a look whether any of those might work. So they went to this piece of land and there were lots of these trees that were tall and slender and young. So they cut all the poles that they needed for free and made this tent to stand. 
where it was to stand. But then they had another problem. They didn't have any chairs. Now, where were they going to get chairs? So they tried to hire chairs. Now, it's, it's quite a while back, so I can't remember you know, the exact figures, but I think it was something like if you hired the chairs, if you rented them, it was $3 a chair. Mm. Now, if you have 500 chairs, <laughs> that's $1,500 per day. That's a lot of money for mm. people that are already you know, struggling. So they couldn't rent chairs. So they were in a quandary. And then they get a phone call from somewhere else that had heard about this quandary and said, you know what, you guys can come and f get our chairs. You can buy them. You can buy them for $1 a chair. And so off they went with a whole lot of trucks thinking how they're going to load all these chairs. And uh, they arrived there and all these chairs were fold-up chairs on trolleys. So he just wheeled the trolley onto the, the trucks and off they went. They got all the chairs. So they got the venue, they got the, the facility, they got the poles, they got the chairs, and they put all this stuff together. Now this was all before I got there, of course, right? They just told me the story. And then when I arrived there, it was the most fantastic camp meeting that you can imagine. It was so, how shall I say it, so simple, so godly. Mm. They had activities. So now between, between lectures, they had activities. And the way in which they dealt with these things. Mm. They had courses on survival. They had courses on furniture making. Mm. You know, interesting things of a practical nature. They took the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and they read and they tried to figure out what would be the right way to go ahead mm -hmm. with this kind of thing. And when you walked into that place with these people that had gone out on a limb and that had walked in faith, and God had supplied everything that they needed. It didn't come out of their riches. It came in spite of their poverty, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the brotherly interaction that you had was of a level that I have seldom experienced. You felt one. Everybody was of one accord. It was almost like being in heaven. Mm. And... You know, if, if everything is there and the money is there and the venues are great and all of these things, uh, that often leads to a show. Mm. But here, yeah, the Spirit of God was working. And it was one of the most blessed experiences that you could have. So in spite of all the opposition, God always make something good come out of it. Amen. And I don't know what happened thereafter, but I have a feeling that from that very place there will come a revival in the North American continent. Mm. Because if it started there, it might also yeah. end there. Mm -hmm. So Martin, you can do nothing against the truth. And sometimes you're in a, in a hard place, and sometimes you feel as though you are sorely treated. But God always turns it around and makes something good come out of it. So don't despair when things get tough. Don't look at people or what this leader does or that leader does. There are other leaders that will do exactly the opposite. Yeah. And whatever creates a debate around issues of truth, you can be sure that God is working and leading minds to study the issue for themselves. Mm -hmm. How many people have said, how dare you say that? Mm. And a few months later say, but I read it now. <laughs> now yes. I understand. Yeah. So don't despair. And even if we make mistakes ourselves, mm. 
You know, we are human, we are fallible, we're not popes. <laughs> we occasionally <laughs> get things wrong, maybe many times get things mm -hmm. wrong, but uh, if the desire is there to have it based on, on truth, on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, then uh, my experience is if it stands there, you can trust it. That's it. Like That's you said in, that in the previous one, or somewhere said, I think it was a song you mentioned. Yes, the God Bible says, says it. I believe it. I believe it. That's, that's it. the way it is. <laughs> that's it. Also. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, this is your church. This is the crucible in which character is developed. If everything was plain sailing, how would we develop a character? It's like a marriage. You have to wrestle through your character defects and you have to allow God to change us so that we can better reflect His glory. Help us to be builders and not destroyers. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.